Ladies and gentlemen, uh, brothers and sisters and friends, I greet you with the Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. There you go. And I'll get a greeting back. Good, good, good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a pleasure being here again. This is, I think, the second time I've been to Surrey University, the very international flavored university, I have to add, which is very good, something you should be very proud of. I'm going to be talking about something very significant today. And what I'm going to be talking about is the fundamentals of Islam. Now, when I try and address this talk, I try to address it in the way of what does it mean to be a Muslim? And what does it mean to be a human being that has adopted Islam as, as his way of life or her way of life? This is the fundamental question. And this is what fundamentals of Islam mean. We want to intrude into the mind of the Muslim. I want to know what a Muslim thinks. I want to know what he believes. I want to know what he feels. I want to swim and immerse myself in his soul. Yeah? I want to taste something of what it means to be a Muslim. This is what I think means the fundamentals of Islam, the fundamentals of Christianity, the fundamentals of anything, any ism and schism, okay? Because as human beings, how do we connect with one another? The way we connect with one another is by coming from nothing. What does coming from nothing mean? Now I'm not talking about physics. What I'm talking about is human relationships. And coming from nothing means following one of the oldest proverbs in the Chinese culture, which is emptying your teacup. Because if you already have tea, English tea, you never know and you'll never be able to taste what Pakistani tea tastes like. Yeah? As many Pakistanis call cha. Okay? It's a bit more herbs and spices than it. Sometimes it's more milky and sometimes more sweet. The only way we could taste that other tea is by emptying our teacup. So in other words, our minds and our intellectual and emotional baggage must be free, because we must come now from nothing. And when we come from nothing with regards to another tradition or another human being, it actually gives us that freedom to create an entirely new realm of possibility with someone else. This is how we connect with another human being. For example, if I were to come and speak to the guy in the turban, I come from Hackney in London, and I come from a Greek heritage, I'm Greek. I know I look Pakistani, but I'm Greek. Yeah? If I were to come to him, say, 10 years ago, before I embraced uh, the tradition of Islam, I would have thought, he can't speak English, he doesn't know nothing about his culture, he's terrible with women, he's X, Y, and Z. This would be my personal interpretation, okay? Because I didn't come from nothing. I used my historical baggage, my skewed perceptions, whether they're right or wrong, in order to connect with the other human being. And it was a bad connection. Because I didn't come from nothing. I came from history. So, what I mean by coming from nothing in this context is allowing us to free our minds from historical links and connotations, whether that means Sky News or BBC, or that means anything else, in order for us to be able to connect positively that way. Okay? So, how do we understand the Muslim mindset? Well, essentially, we could summarize the Muslim mindset, the Islamic mindset, in the following way. Listen to the logic. One, God is all-knowing, all-wise. Two, human beings are not. Three, therefore, and this is the logical conclusion the Muslim will make, therefore, human beings should follow what God has said. Now, there's some very daring assumptions behind this. Extremely daring. And the daring assumptions are that actually God does exist and that He has said something. Now, this is not going to be a philosophy lecture, but I'm just going to swim briefly into the ocean of Islamic philosophy and thought in order for you to take a little taste on what it means to be a Muslim. So, the word Muslim will then try and look at reality to see if these things are true. So, when we look at reality, which, we, which I call the whole and the sum of the universe, the Muslim will come to certain conclusions because the Qur'an, which I'm going to come to later, is actually a very intrusive book that asks you very profound questions. Like, look at the universe, have you not seen creation, etc. So when the Muslim, as a human being, reflects upon reality, some conclusions become very sound for him. 
for example, the existence of God. Now, if we take, for example, the universe, we know the universe could not have just simply come out of nothing. Okay? Because the philosophical principle in Eastern and Western tradition is that out of nothing, nothing comes. Even in physics, where we have the crazy world of quantum mechanics and quantum theory, we're now going towards a deterministic view on particle physics rather than indeterministic view. So things do obey natural law. Things just can't pop out into existence out of nothing. To follow such a thing will be absurd and will not allow us to interact with logic or science in an effective way. So the universe, this whole cosmos, could not have just come out of nothing. Okay? And significantly, the fine-tuning of this universe could not have been done in absence of a designer. And I'm not talking about creatures and evolution, that's another topic. I'm talking about the reason that we're here, that we're breathing, and that we're smiling, and that we're interacting with another, 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 can only be possible, can only be possible if there was a fine tuner behind this universe. Why am I saying this? I am saying this because our very existence, brothers, sisters, and friends, is on a knife edge. It's on a knife edge. Because... This whole universe was based upon an initial conspiracy of values and constants. That without these fine-tuned values and constants, we would not be here today. Let me give you an example. Has everyone heard of the Big Bang? We haven't heard of the Big Bang. Good. It's not that thing that happens after too many curries, okay? Okay. My jokes are getting worse and worse. Maybe I should stop the jokes, okay? Okay, so the Big Bang theory, for example, according to various cosmologists, was that this whole universe, okay, Sprang to be from infinite density zero volume. Well, well, in a more technical sense, at that point, the laws of nature, they break down. Okay, And there's an example where you have a jar and another jar, and the universe, this jar is empty, and then someone just fills it in, and there's no really good explanation. Anyway, the Big Bang has an expansion rate. Okay, And this expansion rate, if it differed by way one quintillionth of a second, okay? One quintillionth of a second, which I believe is one eighteenth of a second. If it differed, the universe would have re-collapsed upon itself. Let me give you another thing just for you to be amused by. Now, according to Paul Davies from Oxford University, the phase space of possible universes, the phase space of possible universes, in order for this universe to come into being, come, come into existence, is something of around 1 over 10 to the power of x. Now, what is x? x is 10 to the power of 123. So think about the number. 1 over 10 to the power of 1 over 10 to the power of 123. You may think that doesn't make sense. Let me give you what it really means in practical terms. It really means that if I was a dartsman, okay, and I'm holding a dart, I would have to hit the center of a proton. Does everyone know what a proton is? It's very, very small, okay? So I have to hit the center of a proton, wait, if the whole universe was my dark hole. So the Muslim, as a human being, as a thinking being, will come to the conclusion and say, well, there's three possible explanations for this. Three possible explanations. One, it's just natural law. It just happens to be there. Two, chance. Or three, design. Well, when you look at these options, I think the most rational conclusion that it was design. The reason I'm saying this is because saying it's natural law means it's just there and that's it. And it would have us to believe that a universe not fit for life could never exist in the first place. But that's impossible, specifically mathematically. Significantly, it would mean that from this fine tuning, we shouldn't be asking any questions. But since we're asking questions, then it can't be just there, that's it. So therefore we go to chance. Can it be chance? Well, the chances are so high, so improbable, that to claim such a thing would be equivalent of me saying, for example, that I don't have to question that a 747 just appeared in my driveway overnight, for example. Now, some might say, well, it could still be chance. But there's a problem here. This means that we can't have a conversation anymore as human beings. Because I could say, you know what? I really believe that my mother is not my mother. She's actually a grey rhino that was born on Pluto and flew here on a giant feather. Now, the person would respond to me and say, well, Mr. Zotis, you are crazy. And I'll say, well, there's a chance. 
So the point is, there's a limit in what the philosophers call epistemic probability. Something the mind can actually agree with. And these probabilities are things that the mind cannot have an agreement with. This is a battle with these numbers. So the best inference, the best explanation, is that there must have been a supernatural designer that designed the whole universe and brought it into existence. So, what follows from here? Well, does the Muslim say in his mind from this type of philosophy? Well, first and foremost, as a human being, what does that do? If there's a conclusion that there is a cause for the universe, and this cause must be immaterial and eternal, then therefore this creates some kind of awe, some kind of resonance in someone's soul. Regardless if you're Muslim or you have a tradition or not, if you do this type of awe, that's why when we have many quotes from physicists in the 60s, including Einstein, whether they were atheists or agnostics is another point, they would still be in awe of the whole design of the universe and the cosmos and the mathematics behind it. Yeah? So this awe that there is something behind the universe that brought into existence, actually now is a driving force for the Muslim to say, wait a minute, surely this being, this entity must have said something, must have announced himself to mankind. Why else? I mean, he, surely he can't be an absentee landlord. That doesn't make any sense. So, what the Muslim will do, what the thinking human being will do, is investigate and try to find out, fine, if he did, or it, or whatever it is, said anything at all, then what did it say? And this is the struggle for the Muslim. So the Muslim says, well, surely there must be some criteria, rational criteria for what we call revelation. As you know, the Muslims believe in the Qur'an, which is the book of the Muslims. And the criteria for revelation is very sound and agreeable with the human thinking mind. For example, the, group, the criteria are, one, it must be internally and externally consistent. It can't contradict itself in an irreconcilable way. Two, it must have a logical view on what this cause for the universe is. For example, if someone said to me, this cause for the entire universe that must be immaterial is actually a human being, then I would have a problem with that. Because how can the universe be in existence and not existence at the same time? It's absurd. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's like saying, for example, can there be a square triangle? We should even utter the statement in the first place. So you have to have a very logical sound view on the conception of this being on this God. The third criteria, which is the most rational criteria, is that it must have a signpost to the transcendent. In other words, it must have some evidences in the book itself that profoundly show that it's from the divine, or it's from this thing that is greater than humanity. And Muslims would argue that actually the Qur'an has these signs, and they include many signs. Historical, natural phenomena, scientific, linguistic, etc, etc, etc. For example, if we look at the 78th chapter of the Qur'an, it actually mentions that the mountains have peg-like structures with peg-like features. And we just discovered this like 30 or 40 years ago with regards to the mountains having root-like shapes. So if you go to any ge geology book, you see mountains, for example, there's a mountain, and underneath there'll be another peg-like structure which is considered to be the root of the mountain, which without them, there will be more earthquakes and it would further destabilize the earth. Uh, and this is basically something that was mentioned 1400 years ago in the Qur'an and this is one thing out of many things. And this is shows that how can an illiterate man, which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessing be upon him, was an illiterate man, from an illiterate people, without even the tools and techniques and, and, and mechanics and technology to discover these things, how can he just utter these things? Surely it just can't be by chance. Especially when we add everything that it has to say all together. When we go into embryology, when it talks about the three layers of darkness, for example, and the three stages of embryology, how can one fathom this? Especially 1400 years ago without a microscope. And continues and continues and continues. So there are some signposts. So therefore, it logically follows to the Muslim that there is an element of conviction. Now, it doesn't mean there's a monopoly of truth here, no. But rather, for the Muslim, they say, look, we're starting, the foundations is based upon an element of conviction which the Qur'an seeks to address and tells us to look into the universe for these things. For example, when the Qur'an says, I'll recite the Arabic first, وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصُّلُ الْعَيَاتِ لِقَوْمَ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And thus, do we explain our signs and evidences for people who reflect, يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Now this word in the Arabic language doesn't mean reflect like a desert romantic. 
touch the sand and look at the stars and sip your milk. Yeah? So the point is, it's not being a desert romantic, it's rather the thing that you're reflecting upon, you must inquire about its implication. What does it really mean that there's a mathematics behind the universe? What are the implications to this? What does it mean that things just kind of come out of nothing? What does it mean that we have a consciousness and consciousness doesn't relate to matter and material things? What does it mean? So this is what yatafakkaroon means for those who reflect. It actually means the thing that you're reflecting upon, don't just briefly look at it. Inquire about its implications. There's something deep and buried behind the universe. So, there's another aspect as well, because some may argue, well, these philosophies and arguments for God's existence and the miracle of the Qur'an are abstract. We want a personality here, yeah? Because people always look up to other people. And we would say the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, is that personality. Not only because he was the carrier of this divine book for the Qur'an, but because of his call. And his call was very unique because the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and his books at the back with regards to his biography. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, was the only man in history to have united one third of the planet at that time. Significantly, he was the only man in history to be successful from a secular perspective, i.e. he was a statesman, and also from a spiritual perspective that he developed a fully functional religion that was self-contained, which means it explains itself within itself. And this is remarkable. This is no wonder Michael Hart in his book, A Hundred of the Most Influential Peoples in History, he actually named Muhammad وسلم, as the number one person. So he had, a, he had a claim to prophethood, a claim to say, a very simple claim to say that there is no deity worthy of worship apart from God. Do not associate any partners with God, which basically means your reference, your reverence, your reference point, your love, your desire, your worship is singled out to God Himself, not to any other intermediary, whether it's a stone, it's a book, another human being. Because these are things that are barriers to the divine connection between the human being and the divine. So this was the very simple call of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It was very intuitive. It could almost make sense. You know, why do I need another stone in order for me to connect with something? Well, it's outside of the universe of God. As a concept, it makes sense. So this call, someone may say, well, he was a liar. This guy, he may be saying good things, but he's a liar. But the problem is, it's very hard for us to claim that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was a liar. Because when someone lies, they lie for material gain. Or they lie for an agenda. For example, I'm going to lie because, I don't know, I would really want to marry this woman, yeah? Or something, yeah? Or whatever you guys lie about. Which we shouldn't lie, but, you know, people lie. So, with regards to the Prophet sallallahu he was actually boycotted from his beloved city. His companions were tortured. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he loved children so much that he would almost curse another person for not kissing his children and embracing them with love. But yet he was stoned. He was stoned in a city in Arabia by children. But yet he kept this call. How can this be a liar? His beloved wife passed away. He was so hungry that he had to tie two stones to his stomach. To the point where him and his companions had to eat the leaves of the trees. This was the reality. This is a historical fact. Eastern and Western scholars. We don't have to waste our time researching this. This will happen. So how can this man continue this life for 23 years? Surely, maybe another explanation is that he was deluded. So he wasn't lying, but the thing that he was saying was not true. But how could he be deluded? How could the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, be deluded? Because can this religion that has lasted 14 centuries, applicable in the modern world, actually be the result of a deluded man? Because what comes from a deluded man is delusion itself. And I'm going to give you one example with regards to the fact that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu cannot be deluded. Economics. Everybody loves economics, okay? We live in a capitalist society. Whether you like it or not, no matter how long your hair is, how long your beard is, money makes sense, yeah? Who's going to disagree with you? 
Dude. Okay, good. He's born from a millionaire family, yeah? So money doesn't matter, yeah? So, economics. The Islamic economic model, for example, has transcended modernity. Because it's timeless. It's lasted 1400 years with regards to its economic principles, as an example. And let me compare it with the capitalist model. Now, the capitalist model is geopolitical theory. Now, what I mean by geopolitical theory, I'm going to explain it a bit. It's geopolitical theory says there's too many needs, not enough resources. This is why you have competition in capitalist economic theory. Too many needs, not enough resources. Okay? But the alternative geopolitical theory was the one of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which he said in narration that could be found in the collection of At-Tirmidhi. He said that the son of Adam, in other words, the human being, his necessary and finite needs are food, shelter, and clothing. So that created a geopolitical model that said there's enough needs and enough resources. And when we study geopolitics, we see that there is actually enough resources in the world to feed and clothe and shelter 36 billion people in the planet. That is an approximation. So the problem here is not resources, it's actually modeled in system. And for example, Islam gave amazing mechanisms to deal with this problem of the distribution of wealth. For example, one of them, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, was the zakat system. The compulsory spiritual tax, if you want to call it, which is 2.5% of all the wealth, of, of rather your, your excess wealth. Significantly, if we read, for example, even the second chapter of the Quran, there's a whole dossier, if you like, of giving the economic stimulus and the driving force for believers and human beings to give money, to give charity. For example, a very famous statement of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, giving charity does not diminish your wealth. Think about this. Look at this driving force to give now. And to one point where there was a non-Muslim tribe, he wanted to get money from the Prophet because he was a statesman at that time. And he said, I need money, I need resources for my tribe. And the Prophet was giving, giving, and giving, and giving. And this guy took it all. And he went back to his tribe and said, I just been given things by someone who he does not fear poverty. See, this is the kind of like philosophy behind you know economics in Islam. Significantly, interest-based transactions and interest as a principle is abolished. And the reason for that, because from an economic perspective, it can be argued that interest is an impediment to the distribution of wealth. I'll give you an example. If I were to buy a really big house, and I have to pay an excess £200,000 just on interest alone, then it's excess money. However, if there was shared risk with the owner, as an example, and I would have to pay interest, I'll have excess money in my pocket. Now, some may argue with that excess money, they can hold it. But there is a chronic injunction that says you cannot hold wealth. And also, since your excess wealth will be decreasing 2.5% each year, that provides an economic stimulus for you to inject back into society. So just very briefly talking about the Islamic economic system, how can this be from a deluded man? It's outdated other economic systems for the past 1400 years. To the point where when the credit crunch happened, you had American economists coming down in London universities and saying, we may have to think carefully about the Islamic economic model. Because it's got some ge- geopolitical principles and macroeconomic principles that make sense, that work. Do you see? So how can this be from a deluded man? It's not. Significantly, a very famous saying of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, which means you're not a true believer unless you love for your brother or you love for yourself. And brotherhood here, according to the scholar who compiled this narration, it's insania, it's humanity, the brotherhood of humanity. So is this a deluded statement from a deluded man? You're not a true believer unless you love for others or you love for yourself. So you can't be deluded. Now some would argue that well, he was both. He was deluded. And he was speaking the truth. Well, this doesn't make sense. Can I be two places at the same time? Can I be lying and know that I'm lying, but yet saying I'm not lying and believe I'm not lying, yet it not being a lie at the same time? No, it doesn't make any sense. So for the Muslim, the personality of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is part of the argument, is part of the internal mechanism of his being in his mind, that this human being was actually speaking the truth because we've deduced he could not be lying. 
he could not be deluded, he could not be both, then the best explanation is that he was speaking the truth. Now, in a very brief summary, I have given you the intellectual foundations for the Islamic worldview. The intellectual foundations for Islamic worldview. Now, what do Muslims believe? Well, since we've given the basis for the logic I said in the beginning, one, God is all knowing or wise, two, human beings are not, three, therefore human beings should follow what God said. Since we've given the intellectual foundations and basis for this, now these are some of the beliefs of the Muslim. The Muslim has to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah meaning God. Okay, this is the name for God, as the sister said in the beginning, doesn't have any plural and has, it has no gender. The name for God. And the very basic essence of God is described in the 112th chapter of the Quran in a very profound way. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ اللَّهُ سَمَدْ لَمْ يَلِيدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُفُوا وَنْهَدْ Say, He is God, the one, unique, the eternal, the self-sufficient. He begets not, nor was He begotten, and there is nothing comparable to Him. He is transcendental. This is why Islam has a very anti-anthropomorphic view on God. How can God share any qualities with human beings? He is transcendent, logically and theologically. So, this is who we believe in, God. We believe in His messengers. And we believe the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was the seed of all prophets. He was the seed of all the messengers. And we believe in the messenger Jesus, in Arabic Isa alayhi salam, peace be upon him. And did you know, Jesus is mentioned 25 times in the Qur'an. The Prophet Muhammad is only mentioned four times in the Qur'an. Jesus is mentioned with some amazing names, such as Ruh Allah, the Spirit of God, Kalam Allah, the Word of God. So Jesus theologically, although we say that He was not divine, He was just a human being with a very unique message, we say that Jesus has a huge theological position in Islam. This is like the similarities here with regards to the Christian tradition. Especially when we go into Christian history and we look into the early origins of Christian history, if we go to the Carpocratians, the Basilians, the Nazarenes, etc., before Nicaea, before all the priests came together and decided it would be in the Bible, there was actually early Christians who believed in this type of Jesus, that he wasn't divine, that he was just a man with a message. So some would argue that the Quranic narrative for Jesus is actually the early historical narrative for Jesus. But that's another discussion. So we believe in his message, we believe in his books, meaning we believe in the Quran, and we have good evidence to do so, as I mentioned before. But it also means we believe in the Bible, and we believe in the Torah, and we believe in the, in the, in the, in the Psalms, and we believe in all these traditions. But the only thing that we differ is that these traditions with regards to the chain of authenticity, with regards to knowledge and today, has been broken. Has been broken. For example, you go to any modern day Christian scholar, and you would see that there's approximately 11,000 versions of the New Testament from 200 years after BC to about the 19th century. And you still don't find any folio that actually 100% agrees with each other. So the Muslim would argue that there's a broken chain of authenticity here. But we still believe that these were revealed texts. So in Islam, a Muslim doesn't believe that he has a monopoly on truth. He doesn't. All he's saying is he's saying that we just have an unbroken chain of information. We don't say we have a monopoly. So you believe in the books. You believe in the angels. Angels being these creatures that have no will, they just submit fully to the will of God. And they act the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you believe in the we said the books, the angels. Well, is the Muslims? Or the hereafter, in the day of judgment. The day of judgment is such an awesome event where it says that human beings they would stare in awe and fear. This tremendous event that would happen to actually account us. And this is excellent for moral philosophy. If anyone studies moral philosophy, they would see that, in, this is my opinion, that in the atheist moral philosophy worldview, although atheists are very moral people, I'm not saying that, there's a problem with moral drive, driving force and motivation. Because if you're just going to die and that's it, then if you're the strongest and the most powerful, then let me get away with it. And this has happened in history. We look at the history of Stalin, 
Paul, Paul, and Mao, etc. 20 million dead, 6 million Christians died, etc., etc. But if you do you have a conviction, don't get me wrong, religious people have committed lots of atrocities here, yeah? but that's another discussion. But generally speaking, from a more philosophy standpoint, believing in an accountability, in a day of judgment, an awe inspiring event, you're going to be like frightened, conscious that, you know what, it doesn't end here. It doesn't end here. This is a positive moral philosophy because it gives you this kind of driving force and moral motivation to do things such as good deeds and prevent you from doing things like injustices. And then we believe in the Qadr. We believe in the divine decree. And I think the best way to explain such a complex topic is in the following statement. If someone were to ask me, do I believe in destiny? I would reply, I believe that a man does what he can until his destiny is revealed. I think that's the best way to describe Qadr, to describe destiny. Because for the Muslim, we believe there's two spheres of control. There's a sphere that you can control, and there's certain causes to in this sphere. And these causes were created by God Himself. So the girl, I could take a knife, I could butcher someone, or I could cut an angle. Okay? So the cause was created by God, but I have a sphere of control here. Okay? So this is the type of the philosophy that we discussed that God knows everything, and yet our destiny is preordained. So this is the basic beliefs of the Muslim. And from these beliefs there are certain actions. And we all know and we've heard about the five pillars of Islam. Now the, fa- the first pillar of Islam starts with the statement or declaration of faith. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship by God and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is his final messenger and his servant and slave. This is a very profound statement. If you say this with sincerity, you become a Muslim. And this becomes a paradigm shift for the human being, something I'm going to explain later. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is prayer. Now Muslims have to pray five times a day. And you may observe this later. Prayer though must not be misconstrued as supplication. Because when we think of prayer, we're thinking of, Oh God, please help me. No. Prayer in Islam is something a bit more dynamic. Because if, and when you see it, you'll see what I'm saying. Prayer is a mechanical movement. It's, a, it's movements. It's prostrations. It's bowing. It's standing. It's also sound. You hear things. It's also reflection. It's also supplication. It's also meditation. It's also divine discourse. It's also having a divine discourse with the divine. Because, for example, a famous prophetic tradition is that when you're in prostration, you are closer to your Lord, so supplicate and talk to your Lord. So prayer in Islam is not just asking for something, rather it's a dynamic program of activity that includes meditation, supplication, sound, movement, etc. After the prayer, we have zakat. And I mentioned zakat, and zakat is, if you like, the spiritual tax. We have to pay, as Muslims, 2.5% of our excess wealth. And this goes to the needy, to the poor, to the wafer, to the traveler, to the one struggling with God's cause, etc, etc, etc. And this is an amazing kind of system that actually deals with the economic problems of society. For example, if you read Philip Manson's book, Constantinople, when they applied in Constantinople under the Uthmani Khilafah, the Uthmani Caliphate, what happened was, is that you would see Jewish rabbis writing letters to the brethren in persecuted Europe, telling them to come to the land of the Muslims. For example, there's a letter in 1453, and this rabbi says, you know, all my brethren come to the land of the Turks, in other words, the Muslims. We have great wealth here, we're not taxed heavily. We have rich other fruits of the earth. So, and this is all because of the zakat system. And if there was anyone who was poor, whether Jew, Christian, Muslim, non-Muslim, they will be dealt with in this bank, if you like, called the Bait al Man, which is basically like the house of wealth, if you like, yeah? And from this, the zakat, the money, the charity money, and the spiritual tax will be collected there and given out to the poor. For example, when I went to Turkey, and you have the old Ottoman mosques, and you have two huge marbles, okay, with holes in them. And basically, when you, they used to put their hand in there and either leave gold coins or take gold coins as you wish for the day. And those were always full. So that means that people were always giving money or people, when they were taking, it was suffice for them. 
So there was no poor people at a period of time. Think about this. Think about this. No poor people. So we have the zakat system. Then we have fasting. Fasting. In the month of Ramadan. So, and this fasting is amazing. I mean, from a Muslim perspective, fasting is actually can be described as a giving you the ability, the realm of possibility to feel like what it means to be alive. Do you know that? Fasting actually allows you to reflect on what life means. I tell you what, if you know we're always eating, we're always thinking, we're always being busy, we don't have time for our kids, our family, our work, we're all over the place. So we don't know what life really means. But when you're fasting, you know, everything is cut off in regards to your physical necessity. You know, you can't even have sexual interaction with your wife during the period of fasting. So you'd be thinking about certain profound things. And when you pray, it's more intense. When you think, it's more reflective. And this is the amazing thing about this spiritual disease called the stomach. You know, the Prophet Muhammad said, there's nothing more worse than you can feel than your stomach. Because if you think about it, try thinking after a big curry. You can't think. Imagine doing an essay after a curry. Yeah? Try playing football after a curry. Yeah? Try doing anything intellectual after a curry. Or try doing anything spiritual after a curry. Try and contemplate after a big huge curry. All you're going to do is sit down and just be sloth. Yeah? Yeah? Do you see my point? So it has a value point here. So fasting in the month of Ramadan, which its main objective is to create good consciousness within the human being. Because in the Quran it says, In order for you to attain righteousness, you attain God consciousness. And in this month you do with excess prayers, with more, with more reflection, with dhikr, which is the remembrance of God, and supplication, and meditation, and so forth. And the final pillar of Islam is actually the pilgrimage once in your lifetime, which is traveling to Hajj, traveling to Mecca, and fulfilling the rights of the major pilgrimage. And that is only if one can afford it in their lifetime. So these are the basic pillars of Islam. And now from these, there's other teachings that we follow too. Because the Quran and the Prophet's teachings tell us to do certain things in society. For example, what's quite unique about the Prophet Muhammad message is that 60% of his message is a social phenomenon. For example, in one prophetic tradition, the Prophet said, believe in God, feed the poor, and spread the peace. 66%, percent of that is social. Because individuals is believing in God, and the other one is feeding the poor, which is a social act, and spreading the peace, which is another social act. So a lot of the teachings of Islam are very socially based, they're very based around geopolitics, economics, society, and how to change and revive society. Significantly, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa emphasized very seriously on neighborliness. Neighborliness. And what does it mean in neighbor in the Islamic sciences? According to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it actually means 40 houses to your right, 40 houses to your left, and if you come from where I come from in London, it's 40 houses up and 40 houses down. Yeah? Because you're in a book estate. Yeah? So you have like a four-dimensional social policy here. Yeah? <laughs> so the point is, and they have certain rights. The point of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that I was so scared that the angel Gabriel he would have said that whoever dies, you have to give some of your inheritance to your neighbor. This is how much the emphasis on the rights of the neighbor is. This is why the famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, he said, Wallahi la mu'min, which means by God, he is not a believer. He said this three times. And everyone's like saying, wow, who is this person? And the Prophet replies, the one, the one who basically harms his neighbor. It's the seriousness of neighborliness in the Islamic tradition. Significantly, we have other things like feeding the poor and freeing slaves and all these kinds of acts that seem to be very compassionate and very uh, positive. But what I'd like to do, I'd like to end on the central theme of Islam. Because one may argue that many traditions share these good things, and it's true. Even if you don't have a tradition, as a human being you share these things. Of course you do. But the fundamental point here is about meaning. It's about meaning 
and about purpose. Now think about it. In absence of a message, of a divine transcendental message, in absence of a God, there is no true meaning or purpose. Think about this. Because there is nothing that transcends human subjectivity. Nothing that makes it objective. So in other words, the humanity is on a sinking ship. We're on the Titanic. Because we're just going to die. And that's it. Humanity's going to fail. It's going to finish. Either we're going to kill ourselves because of nuclear armaments, or we're just going to die because, as the physicists tell us, that this is gonna, we're going to suffer a heat death. And the sun's going to burn up the earth one day. So if we don't move to Venus, uh, sorry, if we don't move to Mars, we're all in trouble soon. So we're on a sinking ship. So one would, one would argue, what's the point of reshuffling the neck chairs or shaking the hand of the gentleman or giving the granny a glass of milk? What's the point? There's no deeper meaning. There's meaning, but no deeper meaning. Now, when I'm saying this, I'm saying this with regards to the Islamic message because Tawheed, which was the message I talked about in the beginning, which is the oneness of God, is the backbone, is the fundamental conceptual foundation for the Islamic tradition. Which means your reverence, your reference, everything they do is for the sake of God, not for the sake of the ego, not for the sake of pride or desire, or these things that are seen to be very ephemeral and ephemeral in the Islamic tradition. Things that are empty and just matter. It is material, it is molecules. Rather do it for God, rather transcends your ego. And this is a great spiritual struggle for the Muslim. And this concept of Tawheed is fundamental. And it actually creates a different world view. Imagine having green glasses for all your life. And all of a sudden you put yellow glasses on. All you're going to see is yellow. It's going to be, wow, this is amazing. I can see yellow things. It's all different. I'm bored of green. Yeah. This is what Tawheed does for the believer. The oneness of God. Let me give you a practical example. In the oneness of God in the Islamic tradition, it means that there is no true power except the power of God. Think about this concept. There is no true power except the power of God. So this gives the human being a new realm of possibility to achieve what they can. If you want to be a mother, an engineer, a doctor, and an activist, you can do so. You can't blame creation anymore. You can't blame the material world anymore because if you believe the only true power and force is God, then you cannot actually bring power to creation. And after trying your best, if you did fail, then it's because of the will of God, because God uses creation and material things to manifest His mercy and His will. And if you fail, then it's still good, because our prophetic tradition tells us, Ajaban, Ajaban being amazing, is the situation of the believer. When something good happens to him, he is thankful, and that's good for him. And if something bad happens to him, he is patient, and that's good for him too. So as you can see, following this type of philosophy doesn't give you this fearful reference to powerless things like material objects and human beings. Because you just set your goal straight on saying, in reality, the only power is the power of God. So as you can see, Tawheed as a concept changes who you are and how you see things. And it should change who you are and how you see things and how you can achieve things as a human being, adopting the Islamic worldview in the 21st century. So, let me summarize. We talked about the intellectual foundations of Islam. We talked about the philosophy of the teleological argument. We talked about the design argument. We talked about the cosmology. We talked about the need for a relation, the criteria for a relation. We talked about how there's some rational signposts in the Qur'an that indicates from the divine. Then we talked about the truthfulness of the personality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he couldn't be a liar, he couldn't be deluded, he couldn't be both, he must be speaking the truth. Then we spoke about the beliefs of Islam, beliefs in the angels, in God, in the books, in the messengers, in the day of judgment, in the hereafter, in the divine decree. Then we believe, we talked about the actions of the Muslims, the five pillars, the testament, the testament of faith, the declaration of faith, the prayer, the fasting, the zakat, the, the charity, the hajj, the pilgrimage. Then we talked about other things like neighborliness, and most of the teachings of Prophet Muhammad being social in origin, and in action, and in practice. Then finally, we spoke about the concept of Tawheed, the oneness of God, and how it can apply in allowing us to free ourselves to achieve what we can as human beings. 
giving us this new realm of possibility to achieve what we can. Because in reality, there is no true power apart from the power of God. So, I've left it very well for 10 minutes for question and answers. Okay? So, I hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as I enjoyed it. Because to be honest, I don't do this for you, I do this for me. I always enjoy when I talk. That's the Greek in me, and yeah? we just talk all the time. So, I think I give this opportunity to raise some questions. Maybe we can have a conversation. Because uh, from conversation, you have connection. Uh, and I think, uh, let the conversation begin. Does anyone have any questions? Surely you ask some questions. Excellent. Sure. Okay. Uh, the gentleman is saying about alcohol. He thinks that alcohol is not actually prohibited in Islam. It's just not recommended. The mainstream classical opinion with regards to alcohol that is prohibited for the Muslims. Okay. For example, if you look into Islamic history, you look into Islamic Spain and other places like governance. You see that alcohol was allowed for other traditions, like the Christian and the Jewish tradition. This was fine. But for a believer, someone who believes in the Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, we know that alcohol itself is prohibited uh, in general. And to be honest, a little bit less alcohol, especially in this country, would be great, man. I mean, if you look at the NHS, it spends like 1.6 billion on alcohol related problems. Uh, 6,000 people die because of alcohol as well. And it doesn't mean alcohol is evil, but, you know, maybe a little bit less alcohol would be a good thing for everybody. But yeah, so generally it's, uh, it's prohibited. Although some people do argue that it was prohibited in stages in the Quran. Uh, and that's another perspective. Yes? Is there any research done on it? Is there any research done on Islamic economics? Yeah. Oh, of course, you have degrees and you can do masters, maybe even in this university, on Islamic finance itself. Uh, a good place to start is to go to islamic-finance.com, I think. Uh, or to buy the book, The Problem with Interest. It's a highly recommended book. It goes through, even talking about entropy, it's by this author called Tarek El Diwani. And he had some non Muslim economists review it and had very positive reviews uh, talking about the Islamic economic models. It's called The Problem with Interest. And if you go to theproblemwithinterest.com, you would see some literature alluding to the Islamic financial model. It talks about the gold and silver standard, and it's all these types of different aspects of Islam. There's a question at the back. Hi, uh, I want to ask a question from the all non Muslim side. Uh, there's a big talk about the freedom of speech and freedom of thoughts and freedom of idea on the other side of the world. How you import this in the Islamic terms? What is the freedom of speech? Freedom is what are the what are the what are the limits and what are the non boundaries? How the people should live, how people should not live. Yeah, that's a good question. I've been off, off misquoting by the media on this yeah. topic. Maybe it's time to redeem myself. Um, see what we have to understand, when we talk about freedom of speech and freedom of expression, we have to understand it in a true context. Because even us Westerners, living in Britain, we don't even understand where this concept came from and why it came about. Essentially it came about because in the Middle Age period, or the mid mid medieval period, 15th, 14th, 16th century, we had the Catholic Church at the time, which may have been a misinterpretation of Christianity, that's not a topic, that basically was stopping thinking, stopping thoughts, and you know, 100,000 witches were burned even in the Protestant era, yeah? And the last witch was burned was in 1739 in Scotland, I think, yeah? So, you know, uh, you know, th th there was issues. And I think the philosophical tradition of John Stuart Mill and we had Thomas Paine later, etc., they were discussing freedom of speech, that actually we need to have freedom of expression to come for truth, accountability, and justice. If you don't have freedom of expression, you can't have truth, accountability, and justice. So these were the driving goals for speech. It, they never, and if you read the philosophical Western tradition and be uh, clued about it, you would see that John Stuart Mill, for example, what did he say? He did say, he said, if speech is going to go against morality, then you can't tolerate it. Because you're going to allow anything. Is this an uncivilized behavior? You can't insult people. Now this doesn't mean 
having intellectual discourse and debate. You can't have that kind of insulting, yeah? Because sometimes me not believing in your God might be an insult or a tough luck, yeah? That's another discussion. But I'm talking about like swearing and drawing cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How is it civilized behavior when I know it's going to upset you? If I knew something like the Quranic tradition teaches you, if something's going to upset you, then don't do it even if you really believe in it. You know, don't. But the Quran says don't swear at their God because they're going to swear at your God. Yeah? Very simple logic. So freedom of speech actually means that you should express yourself in order to have truth, accountability, and justice. But it has to be within the realm of the law. And if you look at British law or American law, we have things that restrict speech, like libel laws, freedom uh, uh, defamation laws, hatred speech laws. So there are laws that prevent freedom of expression. Now what the Muslims say is, well we agree with this. We agree you must express yourself for truth, accountability and progress and justice, but it has to be within the law. And what Islam says, the law is to not you know, be rude to other religious traditions. Have intellectual debate and dialogue, like what was happening in Baghdad in many, many centuries ago. But do not have and be insulted. And, and, and that's the profound point. And if you look at Thomas Paine, if you look at the works of John Stuart Mill, he even said, it's like the founding father of liberal tradition, he even said, you can't do things that go against the common morality which he was quoted. I could find the reference. It's called a uh, political theory and introduction. Uh, question of religion. So I think and essentially the point is, if we want to live in a civilized world, there has to be certain uh, common boundaries that we're here to. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on the equality of men? What are my thoughts on the equality of men? I think men and women should not be equal. Can you explain that? Yeah, I'm going to explain that. <laughs> what I mean by that, I just said it just to create some blood, uh, get us warmed up because everyone's really hungry, most of us. What I might mean by this is this. In the Islamic tradition, we believe that men and women are intellectually and spiritually equal. That's without a doubt. However, the prism of equality, the goals of equality, is purely a Western European phenomenon. i tell you why. Because it was women who were very oppressed in the European age. They couldn't vote, they couldn't have any inheritance. Even in the 70s, you needed your husband to sign the paper for you to have a house as a woman. 73, I think, or 79. So there was problems. There was all these oppressive type of laws for women. Something that in the Islamic tradition, Muslims never had. We just never had that historical baggage. So we never developed a theory of equality. We developed a theory of rights and responsibilities. Because as a woman, if you read feminist literature, read Diane E. Russell, Marilyn Friedman, read feminists, and they would say, why on earth should man be the yardstick? That's an old, outdated feminist cliche. Remember, the feminists are like, we go be like men. No, be like a woman, whatever that means. Be like a human being. So the yardstick should not be the man. For the, in the Islamic tradition, the yardstick is the divine call. So for the man, he has certain roles and responsibilities. For the woman, she has certain roles and responsibilities. And they mesh together very uniquely. I advise everyone to read, who's read The Surrendered Wife? It's not written by a Muslim, it's written by a non-Muslim intellectual lady. Read that book, The Surrendered Wife. Amazing, yeah? But actually, it what does it teach us? It teaches us from experience that we need roles and responsibilities to have a cohesive society. And that's it. Uh, yeah, so there is equality of the intellectual and spiritual, but just the way we live our lives, we have roles and responsibilities that are the reference point being the divine call and not being some man, yeah? So I think that's the most important point to take forward. Have you read the book, How You Can No. Uh, 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 I, I, I would read that book. Any other questions? We have about two minutes left. Uh, last question. Um, yes, uh, I'm sorry. I could disagree with many of the things that you said. Oh, my friend, um, Julian. Uh, including the last point. After all, Muhammad did say that women are sufficient intelligence. And that's why the majority of them have. So. My main question yeah, you have to treat it like an ice cream. Okay. My, my, main, my main question would be on the, on the subject of our relationship with God. Um, for Christians, um, the main problem with humanity is not an economic problem, um, it's not 
necessarily an essential political problem. The main problem is the problem of our relationship with God. Christianity teaches that God loves us, he wants to have a relationship with us, but there is a big problem, the problem of our human nature, we are impure. God is absolutely good, absolutely pure, morally, and is holy, we are not. Sure. And this barrier of uh, what Bible calls sin has to be dealt with in some way, it has to be made acceptable to God in order to have a relationship with him. Now it seems to me that Islam does not have an answer to this problem. Oh, what's the question? My, my question would be, can you explain to me what is the Islamic answer, what's the answer to this problem of the barrier of the sin between sure. us and God? Okay, that's an interesting point. I think that shows the differences and similarities between traditions. Now the main difference is that in the Islamic tradition, when we see the birth of a child, we don't see the birth of someone who's got sin, someone who's impure. We actually see someone who's free, someone who's Unblemished, someone who has a fitra. In Islam, we have this thing, uh, this thing called the innate nature, which is fitra, uh, which comes from the root word fatara, fatarun, which means he created it. So God created within human beings something pure, angelic, and then we corrupt it. Yeah? After he, he just goes all wrong. Yeah? So the point is, but we start from a basis of purity, of, of almost a you know, divine kind of expression. Yeah? Whereas in the Christian tradition, you're born and you're, you're sin, you're in sin. This is why the Catholic Church only recently, they had to say that, you know what, this limbo, if you're not, you know, uh, baptized, you're, you're in this like between heaven and hell. Like, this is something that is, in my opinion, unjust. Yeah? So that's the difference. So we won't even agree with the first premise of the problem is sin. We would say the problem is actually not realizing what it means to be a human being. And what fundamentally it means to be a human being is actually to have certain core instincts. And one of those core instincts is the reverence and sanctification of God. And we need to fulfill that re- re- reverence and sanctification. And if you do that properly, we would argue that you would follow the Islamic tradition, and therefore you have a model and system to deal with economics and crime and humanity and, and all these other issues. And the other difference, I think, with the two traditions is that, you know, Christianity has amazing values and morals. For example, it says, you know, love thy neighbor. But I think it's something that goes a little bit more further because it has a huge corpus of tradition. Because what it does, it doesn't say love thy neighbor, but it tells you how to do it. It doesn't say what to do, it tells you how to do it. That's why when we say feed the poor, it actually gives you a whole mechanism and system to do that rather than just leaving it to the mind of man. This is why we had the disastrous history in Europe with the Christian tradition because there was no authority to say this is what the Bible really means and this is what the Bible really means. This is why now a lot of people, I think, if you look at studies, they're moving away from the Protestant tradition to the Catholic tradition again now. Look at Tony Blair, he's jumped ship. The reason he did that, because there's an authority and an interpretative authority that allows you to interpret tradition. So I think the whole question itself, we wouldn't agree with, because we, in Islam, we start from a basis of purity rather than the basis of sin. But we do appreciate that human beings are weak and we need God for that. And also that Islam is not just values, but it's values with mechanisms to implement those values too, hence having an economic system and a model that will actually deal with human problems. And we would argue, if God is merciful, then He would give you a way out of this economic mess, about uh, of poverty. He would just say, love my neighbor, just feed the poor. That's not enough for the human being, because we're different minds, we have lots of differences. We need something to give us right. Here's a model, here's a mechanism, here's a set of values to implement, here's how you implement them. Hence, there's a caste system I talked about. So this is something which I think takes Islam away from being a religion and Sunday service thing and taking up to life. And that's why you have American scholars coming down and teaching people about Islamic economics. And um, yeah, we can have this conversation later. But thank you very much. Yeah, it's the last question. We could talk after prayer. Uh, no, we'll have to stop here. Yeah? Okay. Uh, I'm going to be around after and we could just chat and just have a conversation. I, I don't mind. Uh, I like talking as you. Okay, listen, thank you very much for listening. Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.